I remember being invited by Humphrey Barclay, who you may remember at London Weekend Television, yeah. ITV, you know, when I was first, you know, you know just after I, I'd left Oxford, really, and um, he asked me to write an essay on what kind of comedy program I would like to be involved with. And it was all tremendously pretentious stuff about the fact that, you know, there shouldn't be a studio audience and it should all be very, you know, it, it should all be shot on location and shot on film. You know, desperately trying to, you know, to get away from the traditional simple sitcom or sketch show format that was, you know, popular then as now. And of course, in the end, it was largely, you know, um, ambitious but pretentious waffle. I mean, sometimes, you know, when, you know, merely trying, you know, trying to be original merely because you've learned to be different, you know, doesn't always, well, rarely works, actually. I mean, sometimes it can work, but actually, if you just, you know, try and learn from the past rather than, rather than uh, reject it outright, it can be more beneficial. Oh gosh, yes. Well, I remember, you know, reading the scripts for the first time and them reading like a delightfully sort of, you know, cosy feel to them instead of instead of the extreme scale and ambition of the first series, which was, you know, you know, worthy. And I think, in its way, it was a it, it was a worthy thing to have done and experimented with. But but there was always this feeling. Well, you always hoped it was going to be funny, rather than you believed it was going to be funny. There was always, which was a bit nerve-wracking for everyone, you know, not least the uh, the actors. I think part of the difficulty was that trying to be funny wasn't really what we were about in the first series. We we were awfully arrogant, really. Yeah, yeah, and it was the usual, absolutely, you know, pretentious, you know, bluster, you know, formed quite a large part of it. I think. No, it is hugely ironic that having set about to make the first series of the Black Adder as unlike Vaulty Towers as we could, by the time we got to the second series and had completely rejigged it in the way that it was, we did end up with three sets, you know, and something quite claustrophobic and uh, and and hierarchical. Um, so in many ways, we sort of learned the lesson of our ways that actually our our, our outright rejection of the traditional sitcom form, you know, was not. There are good good reasons for it, aren't there? I mean, why yeah, there are good reasons why sitcoms tend to have the shape that they do. It made a tremendous difference. It was it was just a joy, you know, you know to have real people in the room and 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 to be recording it like a theatre show. Really, you know, we did you know rehearse it all week and then we put on a show for two hours. Admittedly, only you know half an hour of. Uh, of program came out the other end of it, but it, it but it felt like it felt like what it was uh, a live performance, and people even now actually are, are rather surprised when you tell them that you had a studio audience for the second, third, and fourth series. They, you know, they just assume that either an audience had seen it later, had seen it afterwards, or uh, or that it was or that it was canned, or that it was dubbed onto the soundtrack when in fact it wasn't and even though when I look at the Blackadder now which I don't do very often but when I have seen episodes I can see you know moments when I you know stammered a bit or the pause is a bit too long and you think god how frustrating really that we sort of did it on the hoof and we might do one retake but only one um, and how much better it would have been if we'd got every little pause and every little inflection absolutely right in a sort of filmic way of doing take after take after take, which we didn't do. And yet, you know, you have to pay that price for slight inconsistency and slight errors and fault lines in order to get the energy and the feel and the joy of a live performance. And in the end, we, you know, I think it was probably a you know, a sacrifice worth worth making. But I can, you know, you can see, I, I can see now when I do watch it, you think, oh, I'm sure I could have said that line better. Oh dear, you know, Tony came in too early. I wish we'd, oh. But in fact, that was it. That's what it was. You know, you just had to live with the way it was. It's all really about the character of the Blackadder, where the comedy where the inherent 
comedy of his situation is rooted because because basically he's a bright and able man and yet you know things go wrong for him in a way that is that we try to make funny uh, but you know he wasn't a buffoon or he didn't I suppose he, he, he just tended to, to overthink things didn't he to outthink himself or maybe it was just it was just bad luck in the end he, he He's just unlucky. And of course, you know, fatally, he always allies himself with Baldrick. It's strange that interreliance, you'd think someone as bright as the Black Adder wouldn't spend any time that he had to, you know, with uh, Baldrick. Uh, and yet he does. There's a strange interreliance. It is like Basil Fawlty and and Manuel, you know, why, you know, why doesn't he just sack Manuel? Well, there's, you know, there's some way in which they need each other. And the Blackadder and Baldrick need each other, not only for the sake of, you know, to allow us to make the jokes about him, but about them. But, um, you know, there is an interalliance there again. I've got this theory the reason that people love it so much is because of Baldrick, because he's every man, he's us. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Do you think there's anything in there? <laughs> uh, well, he's a pretty dim version of, of every man. I'm not sure I'd like Baldrick to represent me in the sort of in the sort of canon of human existence. <laughs> but but I but I can see how he you know he certainly has a very you know, he has an attitude to life which is uncorrupted by expectations or class structures or education or anything. He just deodorant. takes things or deodorant. Then he just takes things at face value and deals with them as he finds them, and it's um, it's very very. Jo- yeah, I can see it how how that he has a very straightforward attitude. You but know, he's also life. lovable. You wouldn't really call Blackadder lovable, sort no. of almost ever, would you? No, no. Whereas, but, well, no, and, uh, you know, uh, pr- I mean, the Blackadder is a pretty relentless cynic. Although, you see, in my opinion, like like, well, like all the best sitcom characters, pleasingly two-dimensional, you know, pleasingly simple, always the same. You know what I mean? You don't feel at the beginning of have any episode of the Blackadder that the Blackadder's learned something from the three previous episodes. You know, you just know that he's going to have this same old sarcastic, careworn, kill, you know, attitude to life, um, and that's very reassuring. Which is, which is a problem. I think it would have been a, a huge challenge and difficulty if we'd ever tried to make a movie of the Blackadder, because in movies, you know, characters are supposed to be three-dimensional and they're supposed to, you know, realise the error of their ways and change and, and develop and. You know, they're different at the end of the movie as to how they were at the beginning. I mean, you know, maybe we could have contrived a conceit which, have got, which, which would have got round that. But, but in the end, I think the Blackadder is like, you know, Basil Fawlty or, or anyone comparable is a sitcom character par excellence. And um, it would have been very, very difficult to translate into any other, into any other medium, you know, particularly a 90-minute lump of entertainment like a film. I mean, what's been pleasing about the Black Hour in many ways is this feeling, you know, in the 25 years since we first started doing it, is it does seem to have a longevity in the audience's eyes. They, of course, it's, it's uh, period nature helps that, the fact that there's nothing really to date it in people's eyes. There isn't a 1970s sofa or wardrobe or, or political attitude to, you know, to sort of... Uh, to sort of sully the waters in the end you can just enjoy it for what it is even, even though actually at least some of the you know some of the, of the comic attitude of the black adder is the fact that he is was a 20th century man really put in a period situation wasn't he he didn't he didn't really accurately reflect or necessarily you know his time he, he definitely had the attitude of a of a modern audience placed in a period context and that I think you know engages the audience and, and gives it an extra sort of satirical sort of tone to the whole series I think that helps uh, 
well, I do have a problem with the letter B. I do, yeah, quite often when a, when when B is followed by a vowel, you know, bubble was. I remember, I remember at school, uh, my schoolmates getting a lot of amusement out of getting me to say the word bubble <laughs> and me going, you know, stammering it. Uh, so, and I remember the one we had trouble with was a Battersea dog's home, wasn't it? Battersea Dogs Home, which we, we, we had a problem with in the live recording in front of the audience, and I just couldn't say it. I'm, I'm having a difficulty saying it now. Battersea Dogs Home was what I was saying. Um, and then I said, say Crofts instead. Yes, yes and, it was, uh, and I got the word down from the control room that I should say Crofts, which is what I did. And of course it got this huge and totally a disproportionate audience response and absolutely astronomic laugh because they loved the fact that I've, I'd finally found a way around the stammer. <laughs> and, uh, but of course then that laugh had to be taken out because otherwise it would be completely incomprehensible to the listening and viewing audience. Yeah, so it, was a, it, was a, it was a stroke of genius from John Hobbs. But uh, Bob wasn't, yeah, yeah, Bob wasn't an issue. For some reason, B followed by a vowel and then another consonant and nothing else after it. <laughs> Bob is fine. I can say Bob as much as you like. I don't have a problem. Whereas Bobble, you know, like a bobble of wool that I would have more of a problem with. Did Richard deliberately, there was one in the, the Mr. Ploppy episode, wasn't there, Bibble? It is said that people bibble, yeah. put a bucket on their head and say bibble. And what? say bibble, yeah. You, you don't have a problem with bibble either, do you? No, I, I can't remember. If I try and say it now, that I do have a problem with it, actually, but... Bibble, and say bibble. Bibble. Yeah, it's a mystery, it's a mystery. Well, with the second series, really, we started to establish the repertory company that we have, um, you know, you know, not only a sort of, you know, claustrophobic and dramatic setting, but also quite a small and neat, you know, group of people who had a lot of, you know, natural creative empathy with one another, which continued until the end. How did you um, find Miranda to work with? Because it's a... Yes. Well, great, as I recall. I mean, she was, but, um, yeah, yeah, despite being a very good actress, <laughs> she she seemed very willing to muck in because she she did, she did effectively become a, a member of the repertory company, didn't she? Um, Definitely, yeah. Um, and, and she returned on a number of occasions. But she had such a sort of brave and eccentric, you know, creative curiosity to her that it, it, it meant that she... You know, she didn't really care what she did or how she did it. She was just going to enjoy exploring all the possibilities. And, and that's where, <coughs> where that Elizabeth thing came from. It was so interesting, in the, uh, what she did and the way she did it. I thought Rick was great. I, I loved the fact that actually it was entirely complementary to the attitude of the Black Adder. It seemed to me that the two worked fantastically well together. I remember being asked by a number of people, you know, don't you find it rather annoying that that, that, that Rick Mail comes in, you know, and is extremely funny and, and appears to, you know, steal some of your thunder. But but, but because I, I've never really, you know, viewed viewed any acting job except perhaps Mr. Bean, I suppose, as as, as being a singular thing where you know all all or virtually all the comic investment should be in one in one particular character. In the end, the better everyone is, the better everyone looks. You know what I mean? It's like, I remember being being at a dinner party with an actor who was making a, a very honest pitch for the idea that it's much better to be by far the best performer in a drama or in a program and for everyone else to be rubbish and then you can really shine you know, in comparison to other people. Um, and, and it seemed to me to be such a ludicrous way of looking at things that if other people aren't good, you are never going to look good. 
you know, no matter how good you are, you know, it is a, you know, you are in, you are very much interreliant. Yeah, it, it it did seem to get more difficult as we went on. I think my overriding, you know, memory of the whole of the Black Adder Cannon um, was a bit being stressful and satisfying. That's how I remember it. <laughs> well, it was, you know, it was good having you know so many you know writers in the room apart from the writers themselves, who were not in the room. <laughs> um, which, of course... But what did, what did it result in? Yeah, I remember it being intermittently hilarious, I think is how I might describe it, but I remember long, long periods in which it was really not very funny at all, you know, when we got in, you know, when either individuals or, or as a room, we just got in a bit of a slump. Yeah. Or grump. Sometimes very very difficult to drag us out of the uh, drag us out of the ditch. Well, this is the pl plague village. I wonder where we're going to see that. Yeah, like I had a, a real riding lesson. I didn't know that. Like a real movie set, it says here. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> which is quite a funny thing to say about a real movie set. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's really, yeah, true. I suppose that's the thing, but one has a sense well, that one well, the other thing is that it, playing at it. Uh, yeah, exactly. It gives the impression of your of your kind of inexperience, really, and your and your kind of wonder, really, at, yeah. at the fact that the whole thing is yeah. happening. Yes. And the mechanisms and uh, and processes that, that are going on, which are mm. relatively unfamiliar to you. Well, I did. I was completely out of my depth. <laughs> yeah, that's another way of putting it. Yeah. 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 Do you like it? You like it? You no. It. it was pretty difficult, you know, buying Mars bars for you know, for several weeks, <laughs> having to support that haircut. Well, it was very bleak. I mean, I, I remember it being, being, you know, genuinely Northumbrian, a winter weather of the mid a twentieth century, um, being very, very cold, snowy. And not like today. Yeah, I just remember the sort of, just the sense of sort of difficulty of, of everything, wasn't it? I mean, the sort of scale of what we were trying to do, and the number of animals and children and extras, and you know, most of whom you felt had a slightly miserable couple of weeks. Well, it definitely felt out of control, didn't it? That was the thing. Yeah, yeah. Is that, that was you? Thing I, I didn't feel, I was the producer, I didn't know about all these dogs and braziers and things. Somebody made all these executive decisions at some other level. Yeah, I, did, uh, I, just, I just remember a feeling of us not quite knowing what we were doing. That snow covered was where, I'm fairly certain, was where the horse reared up yes, and so I closing, fell off the back. Yes, that's right. Well, well, I say I fell one of your back. people <laughs> yes. fell off the back. Yes, yes one of Who my was it actually? Was he a stunt person? Yes, it certainly was a, a stunt person, but I can't remember which. But you did some of the riding, there, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, the riding, I, I, enjo I enjoyed. I learned to ride, you know, for, for, for this, for the first series. I was taught by a member of the Swedish uh, Olympic equestrian team, who was who was a fantastic rider and a, and a very, very nice man, but of course completely out of his depth. I mean, you know, he, he was being forced to paddle in the shallow end mm -hmm. instead of the deep end where he was more at home. Mm -hmm. And I was, uh, and I, you know, I went there for weeks and weeks and mm -hmm. weeks and learned a little bit. And then I learned a huge amount within two days of encountering the, the real horses that we used. Mm -hmm. And the woman who came with the horses, who of course was tremendously used to making mm -hmm. actors look all right, yeah, you know, act, actors look good, and uh, and then I suddenly started to find a confidence with it. Since which time I've I've hardly ridden at all, hardly ever ride. Is it your masterwork, Ro? <laughs> well, it's certainly not my masterwork. Uh, I may be part of a, a shared um, work which is done very well. I, 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 
Hmm. Yeah, sorry that I'm a bit stuck for words. Well, I... it is fun. I think, I do think one of the hallmarks of it is that it seems uh, better than one remembers it. On the odd occasions I do see it, you think, gosh, this is actually quite good. It's kind of slightly, slightly embarrassing that it's... Yeah, that it's, no, uh, I, and it is, you know, and it did, you know, it was representative of a moment in all our lives. That, you know, that's why I think it's very... You know, it's sort of futile, really, to talk about reunions or a fifth series or, or anything like that, because I think it, it, it represented a comedy consensus, you know, between a group of individuals at a certain uh, yeah. time in their, in their lives. And, and as soon as you talk about, as soon as you try and recreate that chemistry five years later or 10 years later or 30 years later, it's, 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 it's very, very difficult. When we were filming here, it was the first time I'd ever met a camp Geordie. <laughs> uh, we had a dresser, you know, who looked after my clothes and yeah. wardrobe, you know. And, and during my childhood here in the northeast, I just remember, you know, the Geordie accent was the one that, you know, men spoke. You know, it had a natural kind of, you know, masculinity about it. You know, and suddenly you heard this man, man who was talking like that in the most unusual tone. It was, it was a very, very. Go on, give us a. Give us a. What did he talk about then? Well, I can't remember, you know, you know, just what dresses I do talk about, you know, just things that are quite, you know, had not to do with, I can't, I can't remember, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't remember. I mean, the main thing I remember about the wardrobe was the cod piece, or the cod pieces. I remember we had increasingly ludicrous uh, cod pieces and trying to decide which was the best compromise that mm. wasn't so lewd mm. that your eyes were glued to it mm. you know rather than the face of the actor mm. the entire time when it was in the shop <laughs> um, uh, and we compromised on something which actually now when 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 you look at it looks still fairly extraordinary mm. I mean I mean you know I'm not sure that you'd that you'd want to do that kind of thing now or today no I think in the end we were we were over ambitious and slightly pretentious in our approach. So Michael Grade was right, really, to he cancel was. the series. He was. <laughs> he was. Well, we got smacked for it. We, we learned our lesson. But it, yeah, yeah. But we'd already learned the lesson before they cancelled it. That was what was uh, that I frustrating. Think is right. Yeah, I just think that the Blackadder represented a particular comedy consensus between a group of creative individuals at a particular time in their lives and it worked extremely well and it was just a you know it was just a wonderful fluke really that it did work so well you know i mean you may say well you know there are lots of talented people involved so it was bound to be good but as we know that's that's no guarantee of success whatsoever it, you know we were just very lucky to find ourselves all together at a certain time, which was basically the 1980s, wasn't it? It was a child of the 80s, really, the Black Adder. You know, and it worked very, very well for us all. Okay. Thank you all. <laughs>